So thanks everyone for coming out. It really is a gorgeous afternoon that you're wasting with me. Uh, <laughs> rather than being outside. I guess uh, it's, it's a winter in Chicago, which is one reason that I'm here. <laughs> uh, so I especially appreciate it. Um, I want to talk about uh, sovereign debt, which I think is the looming economic disaster of the moment. And, uh, and I want to apply some sort of basic economic principles uh, rather than just just end up today with my opinions on things. I'd like to show you some some sense of why I think what I think, and, and at least we can disagree on uh, uh, thinking about uh, some, some real reasons. Um, so let me start with sort of a survey of where we are. Uh, uh, what is the situation right now? Uh, this is a graph made by the U.S. Congressional Budget Office, which is the path of uh, U.S. Uh, debt. The one to pay attention to is the, the top one, the alternative fiscal scenario. That's the, that's the most likely thing to happen as things are going. And, and as you can tell, this is not good. Uh, but the, with the deficits we've got, this is, a, this is showing you graphically the projected explosion of debt. Of course, this isn't going to happen. There's no way that, that bond markets will lend us this money. Something blows up before we get there, which is the point of the graph. In the round numbers, uh, <coughs> The U.S. has uh, 16 trillion of debt outstanding, two and a half trillion dollars of revenue every year, and three and a half trillion of expenses, meaning we're borrowing a trillion dollars a year. I think Dickens told you uh, what, what state of mind that leads to. Um, we, we say that we like to quote these debt to GDP ratios. Uh, the U.S. debt to GDP ratio is now about 100 percent, but really what matters is is debt relative to revenue. Uh, and so the U.S. pulls in about 18 to 20 percent of GDP in revenue every year. That means the U.S. debt is seven years of its revenue and climbing. Now, let's put this in, in context. Suppose, let me just divide into a number that makes sense for us. Suppose you had $25,000 a year of income, $35,000 a year of expenses, and you were $160,000 in debt. There, there isn't words I can use in polite company to describe your financial situation. Uh, now, we've been here before. In 1945, we were here before. We had, we had debts that size in 1945. But of course, in 1945, we had a radically different outlook. Um, but in 1945, we, we had just finished fighting a huge war, and, and it was very clear the expenses were over, and, and we had a plan to start paying it off. Right now, we're, the U.S. in this situation is, is borrowing a trillion dollars a year forever until we start borrowing more and more. Uh, our, our big problem is not the, the current uh, deficits. It's our promises. We, we call them entitlements. Uh, the U.S. government has decided we're pretty much going to pay for everybody's uh, health care in the amazingly efficient, inefficient U.S. system. We're going to pay for everybody's retirement, and we don't have the money. Now, these promises are debt. They're promises to pay, just like government bonds are promises to pay. The present value of these is a gazillion dollars. Okay, that's a technical term. Actual estimates are like $86 trillion, but you might as well say a gazillion. It's just not going to sum something to that. And, and what's on the budget is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, the U.S. has handed out credit guarantees like Christmas candy. So there's a trillion dollars of student loans, government guarantees. Uh, just about every mortgage in the United States now is government guaranteed. The big banks are too big to fail. The states, the Illinois that I live in, California, they have hundreds of billions of dollars, a bunch of that loaded pension and health care promises, all of that guaranteed. Uh, I said, well, I don't know if it's guaranteed, but, but I can place my bets and you can yours if California says we're in default, whether our government decides to bail them out or not, um, and, uh, you know, if we have face our grease moment. Europe is, is even in even worse shape. And as you know, there's a debt crisis going on. The southern countries are in the 100 to 180 percent debt to GDP ratios. Uh, that crisis is going on, and, and I think it's worth it for science to think about what, what happens to us if, if we let things get that bad. Uh, now, the, the north of Europe isn't in that much better shape either. Uh, Germany is about 80 percent debt to GDP. Uh, lots of Europe has a very low birth rate, so the question of who's going to pay in taxes for all these generous pensions and health care is an open question. 
fact you have to face is there is not enough German money to bail out the South, and uh, they need to face that. France and Belgium are in bad shape. Japan has a debt to GDP ratio of 180 percent. We're facing the the the, 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 so the global sovereign debt crisis is is the possibility that we are all facing. So let's think about the options. Uh, I want to think about what governments could do about it, and maybe should do about it, and that I think will be a, a prelude to what is going to happen. And then we kind of think through what the options are. I think it gives us a better um, a way of, of understanding or of guessing what, what governments will actually uh, choose to do. Uh, so the, the options are, uh, for example, they can pay it off, <laughs> or they can default on it, or inflate it away, which is, is about the same thing. So let's let's try to I'll try to start with the optimistic part. Let's talk about what they could do to pay off this debt. Um, and there really there really uh, three choices: uh, austerity, stimulus, or growth are the choices that, that governments have. As I look at it, I think there's only one option that could actually work and lead to a, a good outcome. So this is not a gloom and doom talk. <laughs> there is a way to get out of this, and, and let's start with with that way. And that is the growth option. Um, so let me tell you why I love growth. Why well, I love economics growth, economic growth for all sorts of reasons. But I think that's the option that, that can get us out of this mess. So I'll, I'll focus on the US. Again, we have two issues. Our first issue is how to get rid of these trillion dollar a year deficits. And the bigger issue is what do we do about, about how do we pay back the huge debt that we have then accumulated, at the same time dealing with, with these explosive entitlements, uh, that, that both the short run and the long run. So I made, I made my next slide, my next thing is really big. I'm an economist, I love equations. I brought you some equations. Uh, at least I didn't use Greek letters, okay? But this is an important one. Uh, it's a really important one. So, so uh, tax revenue, stuff the government takes in is tax rate times income. Pretty obvious, but, but people forget this all the time. Pe people keep saying tax is when they need tax rate, and, and they get this all confused. Now, let's, we, we need some tax revenue. If, we, if we're going to pay off debts, or at least the lower deficits, we need some tax revenue. So, so where can it come from? Well, it can come from raising tax rates, or it can really come from income. And so, uh, growth means let, let's, let, let's let it come from income rather than raising tax rates. Uh, so if we can only get income to start growing, GDP to keep start growing, then we get a lot of government tax revenue without having to raise tax rates. And as if any of you pay taxes, that's an I, I, uh, approach to it that you might actually think is a lot better. So income, uh, raising income with, with growth uh, solves both the short-run problem and the long-run problem. We have to get, get back to where we should be in terms of growth, and then we need long-run growth to pay off the long-run deficits. And uh, this is a preview. Uh, I, I think growth is the, the answer. Uh, and the slowdown in growth that we're observing now is, uh, by, by the other side of the point, the biggest danger that we're facing right now. Uh, those, those, uh, these projections here, these projections here assume a quick return to, to steady Growth rates, and if we if if we have slower growth, then it gets even worse than that. So let me show you some of that. Let me show you how that works. Uh, I brought along a lot of graphs. Uh, this is actually not an economics lecture; it's an art history lecture. You know that. Um, so the point of this graph is to emphasize uh, historically: where did our government make money from and lose money from historically? Where, uh, what caused deficits to happen and what caused us to get out of deficits? Well, the uh, blue line is the surplus or deficit relative to GDP. So up is good and, and down is bad. Um, and you can sort of see the history of the US here. We had some fiscal problems in the 1970s. Uh, then uh, starting in the 1980s, um, our, our surplus, uh, we, we actually, we were in the surplus, we were taking in more than we paid out, and then things have gotten bad. And, and uh, you know, talk about fiscal cliff. We just went over one. You can see our huge deficits uh, of, the, of the recent years. 
The red line is detrend to GDP. So that's where income is going. And you can see there the history of, of recessions, which is fairly familiar. There was a recession in 1990, another recession in 2000, kind of a slowdown in growth. The 2000s were great, and then the huge falling off the cliff that we've experienced recently. So these two, this what ought to be slapping you in the face here is that what causes the US to have, have more or less surplus or deficit. The primary thing is the state of business cycle. When GDP goes down, the government takes in less taxes, and the government also starts spending money like a drunken sailor when GDP goes down. Both of those things are, are effective, and so, so recessions are, are bad times for the government. Now, let's, uh, so what happened uh, in the last recovery, what, what's supposed to happen after a recession, like we've just seen, this is a graph of the uh, 1980 recession, which is sort of a, a, a clear example of how things are supposed to work. <laughs> The black line here is GDP, and you can see there, you know, things are growing in the 70s. Then we had two double-dip recessions, very severe recessions, in which, in which income fell. And then, starting at the second uh, vertical line, uh, we bounced back very quickly. Once the problem was over, we had a period of very strong growth to bring us back to, to where we were headed before. So the pattern you're supposed to see is at the end of a recession, you, you see very strong growth rates, and you get back to the trend line, and, and then you keep, you keep growing for a long time. So there's the short-term growth and the long-term growth. And those are the two things that, that we need to have. Okay, that's how things are supposed to work. Here's what's happening now. Uh, so we have a severe recession, that's the black line. Uh, but we never had that period of bounce back growth. We never even got back to the trend line, and worse, we now seem to be off on a, on a kind of a slower, lower trend line than we were before. Now, tax rate is tax revenue times income. And look at the yawning gaps in income between where we are and, and where we should be. You want to have the government you know, make more money, uh, getting the black line back up to the red line is, is uh, pretty much the project. Here's another graph of sort of the current US economic situation that, that makes me worry. Um, of all the labor market numbers, unemployment, that sort of thing, the employment to population ratio is my favorite. Because unemployment is people looking for work, but people kind of give up and stay home aren't counted as unemployed. They're counted as giving up and staying home. So this includes the people giving up and staying home. What fraction of the population is employed? You can see what happened in, in the recession. A huge fraction of people lost their jobs. And then we're sitting there. So what's going on here is that it, why the numbers you normally see look better? Well, we are adding jobs at the same rate as we're adding people. And so as far as sort of the overall uh, labor market, we're, we're stuck down there, which is not good. And uh, finally, um, uh, here, here's productivity. In the end, economic growth comes from productivity. Nothing else matters but uh, how much each person can make. So if you're, if you're plowing stuff by hand, you, you can have all the stimulus in the world. There's only so much you're going to plow. What you need is a tractor so that you, know, you plow more per person. So here's the history of productivity. You can see the 70s were, were uh, a bad period because productivity was going slowly. 1980s, starting in 1980, the US went through this, this resurgence of productivity growth. We grew very quickly. That productivity growth ultimately is what gave us the, the, uh, the, the uh, strong red line, the GDP growth. That's what gave us the strong government surpluses. That's how we paid off all those Reagan deficits. That was all great stuff. Well, what's happening now? Uh, the blue line is productivity here. And you can see uh, it, it, the black line is the old trend. The black line is the trend from here. The red line is the trend uh, since the 2000s. And you can see a worrying thing. It's not just since the recent recession. We seem to be doing again what we did in the 1970s, it was the 1970s, that about starting 1970, productivity uh, stopped growing very fast. <coughs> that was the, the source of, of most of the huge problems of the 1970s. Well, does that break in trend look kind of like this break in trend? If so, we're, we're in, in deep trouble. <coughs> Let's look forward. Uh, this, um, I'm beating you over the head with this, but I'm doing so intentionally because people tend to forget about this thing, and that's one of my messages. Let's think about how are we going to avoid uh, 
this disaster? Well, we need not just debt to solve this year's deficits. We need to think about, uh, about solving deficits out 10 and 20 years when everybody in the US retires and comes knocking at the government to say, hey guys, you promised to pay for my, my new motor home. Well, again, uh, tax revenue is tax rate times income. So I made a little table here. Uh, what happens if you have 1%, 2%, 3%, or 4% growth? What happens after 10 years and 25 years when all these, when all these catastrophes really get in? Well, if you have 1% growth for 10 years, that's when you compound it, 10.4% growth. 4% uh, growth is pretty good, compound to 48%. Well, 48% is a lot better than 10%. And what does that mean? That means if at the same tax rate, the government takes in 48% more money 10 years from now, as opposed to 10% more money, just by riding the economic growth. No raises in taxes needed, no fiscal negotiations, just let the growth take care of it. Now, now an extra, what do we got here? An extra 40 percentage points of income is not something to sneeze at when, when you're bankrupt. And let's go out 25 years when the big fiscal problems happen. At 4% growth, we have 266 percent more money, whereas at 1 percent growth, we only have 28 percent more money. So the the, 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 what, what's, the the U.S. what it needs is long-term growth in order to pay off this. We've had this accumulated debt over 25 years. We've got to slowly pay it off. What's the one thing that could make it easy to pay off that debt? Well, if you had 266 percent more government revenue as opposed to 28 percent more government revenue. That, that would make an enormous difference. So, uh, let's see, was that, do I have more pictures? Oh yeah, I'm getting to that one. Uh, let, let's think about the historically successful times that, that governments have paid off huge debts like this. Two good examples are, are, are the uh, England after the Napoleonic Wars, which had a debt to GDP ratio of 100%. Uh, the US after 1945, well, what, what has been the ingredient? The, been, the ingredients have been surpluses. You, you can't run continual deficits. So small but steady surpluses, low interest rates, and, and strong growth. In the UK, they had the Industrial Revolution. In the US, we had strong growth in the, in the 50s and 60s. That's how we paid it off, uh, not, um, not, not other gimmicks. So you can see my fear. My fear is that rather than repeating those episodes of strong growth, where you can grow out of your debt or pay off your debt, that we will instead have, have a high-tax, uh, over-regulated, uh, sclerotic growth economy. Uh, we could go back to permanent 1% to 2% growth for a generation, rather than the 3% to 4% growth that we're capable of. Uh, if so, it's, it's going to be a budget disaster, that as well as a disaster for all sorts of, sorts of things. So the obvious policy answer is if we want to get out of this trouble, we need growth. Okay. And growth is, we need growth not for a quarter or a year, not this month's job numbers, not next week's unemployment report. We need the kind of growth that, that lasts for decades. Um, now, now, fortunately, that's, that, that's, not a, uh, that's not a particularly hard problem or an economic problem. As economists, we know where growth comes from. Growth comes from productivity. It comes from new ideas. Uh, it comes from people opening new businesses. It comes from competition. It comes from, I don't, I don't want to say deregulation because that's a bad word these days, but let's call it re-regulation or smarter, simpler, rules-based regulation, property rights, rule of law. Uh, in Europe, it, 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 it comes from getting out of the way. How, how are you expect businesses to hire people if they're not allowed to fire people? It's sort of called structural reform and that sound, makes it sound easy. Now, now, as a matter of Adam Smith, this is, as a matter of economics, this has been around since Adam Smith. It, it's a fairly straightforward exercise. As a matter of politics, it's, uh, I recognize it's very difficult. There's lots of entrenched interests who don't like the, 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 the competition that the growth entails. Well, let's talk about the other option. Uh, I've given you the growth agenda. Let's talk about, uh, oh, I don't want to get there yet. <laughs> The taxes agenda, this is not where our country is going, it's certainly not where Europe is going. Europe is sort of saying to, to Greece and Spain, well, you guys need a structural reform program some few, few years from now, uh, and they're not really serious about what it's going to be. The, the first uh, thing people say when they say, are, are we need to uh, get more uh, government revenue is let's raise taxes. 
uh, in Europe, it's austerity programs, and what austerity has come to mean in Europe is mostly let's raise taxes. Uh, it's your austerity, not the government's austerity. Uh, there's this thing they say in the newspaper spending cut, but cut in the newspaper means, well, we were planning to spend 10% more, we'll only spend 5% more, and that's called a cut. When I, when I tell my wife I'm cutting back on beer because I'm only going to spend 10%, 5% more instead of 10% more, she doesn't call it a cut, and, and that's the same as the need for our budget. The U.S. is following the same path. What's on the agenda now is, is higher taxes, especially, let's just tax the rich, right? We've got a problem, let's tax the rich and, and let them pay for it. This is not even close. Uh, the U.S. right now, the fiscal cliff is in the newspapers. We're arguing about raising uh, the federal tax rate 35 to 39 percent for people over $250,000, raising dividends and capital gains taxes and state taxes. But, but all of this is a fiscal molehill, not a fiscal cliff, compared to the problem at hand. The S, so remember, we have a trillion dollars of deficit until it gets bigger. So even assuming that nobody reacts to these increased taxes by working less, uh, then the administration's numbers say, oh, we'll, we'll pull in 86 billion a year. Well, 86 billion out of a trillion doesn't do you any good. What they like to do is they like to multiply by 10. They say, oh, it'll be 800 billion over 10 years. But of course, the deficits over 10 years are 10 trillion, so just multiplying by 10 doesn't help, help either. And simply not serious. So, uh, and in fact, the latest proposal from the administration had, had $50 billion more stimulus spending and will let everyone out of their mortgages at the same time. So they'd already spent the extra revenue before we got there. Whatever this is about, it's not about uh, solving the deficit problem and paying off the debt. Well, uh, you may say, my liberal friends say, well, let's just raise taxes some more. And, and here you have a deeper, contrastive problem. The central lesson of economics is if you tax something, you get less of it. Um, so again, my, my, my equation for the day is, is tax revenue is, now I'm ready for my slide, tax revenue is tax rate times income. What happens if we start meddling with tax rate? Uh, if you were students, I'll tell you, okay, time to wake up. We're on to bullet point number two, and, uh, and this will be on the exam. But what happens if we raise tax rates instead of uh, do the hard stuff of, of letting income grow, which means getting out of the way? Well, um, there's, there's a deeper deep intractable problem. Um, if you make $100 and the government takes $50 or $60 or $70, there, there comes a moment where you say, what the heck, I might as well stay home and go fishing. Uh, what happens is, if you raise the tax rate, the income declines. Uh, this is the famous Laffer curve, which I brought along because it's pretty, and many of you don't know it, I think it's a, a good benchmark. So how much money does the government make? Well, if the government, on the, the x-axis is tax rate, if the government charges zero tax rate, it obviously takes in no money, so tax revenue is zero on the left. But what happens if the government charges 100% tax rate? This is where they're heading in France, as far as I can tell. We'll just take it. If the government charges 100% tax rate, how much money do they get? Zero. Because nobody bothers to work if the government simply says, we're taking it off. Uh, you know, that's like North Korea or Cuba. I mean, this is real. North Korea and Cuba are simply societies where they're very regulated, and, and they then you try to make anything, they, they take it from you, and then they put them in jail. Um, <laughs> the question is, you know, where are we on the spectrum? You know, those are economies too. Now, if it's zero there and, and zero on the right side, then uh, ipso facto, there's a point where it's the maximum in between, which is Laffer's point. There is a point where if you start raising the tax rate anymore, you actually lose revenue. There's a maximum. And economists love to argue about where that is. That's not really my point. <laughs> um, so the, in, the point is the income declines. If the tax rate goes up, the income declines. Even if we are to the left of the top of this curve, even if, we are, if our governments have not extracted every cent out of us that they can, um, nonetheless, as you start raising the tax rate, just imagine starting left and moving to the right a little bit, what happens is the income declines. And rather than, than uh, going up at a 45 degree line, you, you get less revenue than you thought you would get. So this is, everybody agrees this is true. Economists just argue about, about how much. Um, I, I think 
it's a lot more than, than other people think, which is why I think that taxes, that, that, I'm not going to argue on a moral basis about taxes. I just think it's not going to work. And if it would work, we could talk about whether it would be desirable or not, but it's simply not going to work. Um, now, um, let, lest you think that the top is the right place to be, let me remind you, see how income is a lot lower. There's a, there's a great cost even at, at raising the maximum revenue, and what the government does with the money had better be really worth it. Let me emphasize something here as, as an economist. Uh, your, the, the badge of being an economist is you recognize that margins matter. When, when politicians talk about taxes, they talk about taxes, who pays, who gets, and they slice it and dice it. Um, what counts if you're an economist is if the government takes half of the, half of the next dollar that you're going to earn, what uh, do, do you take the trouble of earning? Uh, the primary damage of taxation to an economist is, is the incentives. An economist doesn't care if I tax, take money from you and give it to you. You don't like it, you love it. But as far as the overall economy is concerned, it doesn't matter at all. You don't get to have a beer, you get to have two beers. Aggregate demand is two beers. What the, the problem with taxation from an economist's point of view is if I say I can do this, then you don't show up to the lecture, <laughs> right? The, the incentive problem. So, so it, you have, um, to analyze taxes, you have to think about not taking money or giving money. Those are important, and, and politics and fairness and so forth matters. But the most important thing is, uh, is the incentives. So and if I ever get to be language czar, uh, I'll never say raise taxes or lower taxes. We have to say raise tax rates, as to tax says, and especially marginal <laughs> tax rates. So how big is, you know, with, with that in mind, because this is about the incentives, how big is it? How big is the Laffer effect? Uh, you can, looking at this graph, you can talk yourself into it's not that bad. And, and let's just look, tax revenue is tax rate times income. So uh, if I change the uh, tax rate, suppose I change the tax rate from 35 to 40 percent. That is a 15 percentage point raise, 15 percent, not 15 percent, 35 to 40 percent, we're talking about the U.S., is a 15% rise in tax eds, so income would have to fall by 15% to not make any money. It's like, well, come on. It, it, 35 to 40%, are you really going to report 15% less income because of that? Let's not worry about it, John. But that's, that is, I think, uh, I, I think there's four considerations that tell you that this incentive effect of taxes is much worse for, for our economy than, than that suggests. First of all, um, progressivity. We do not charge a flat 30%, 35% of all incomes. The way all of our systems work is we charge uh, poor people less and we charge rich people more. Uh, and and, and, uh, and that's, that's just how we do it and how we're going to do it. So I worked up a little example here to show you what the effect of progressivity is. So my green line here is the uh, marginal tax rate. So people from, I, I just, this, is, this is not real it's not a real economy, it's this, a simple example that you can calculate your head to make it clear. So let's set up our, you know, we'll, we'll start a little island uh, south of here and, and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll bail out of the world, but we're going to, we need to raise some taxes. Okay, so what's the tax rate? It would be wealth. People making from zero to $20,000, we won't charge them anything. People making from twenty dollars to $40,000, let's charge them 10%. And, and above $40,000, all income above were from forty dollars to fifty. dollars We'll charge them 40%. We're going to tax the rich here uh, to, to pay for our, our we're going to have some nice social programs. So again, okay, that, that seems like a reasonable tax schedule. Now what happens if you do that? Well, uh, the way this works, of course, is, is that you're only, the person making $30,000 doesn't pay any tax on his first $20,000 income. <coughs> he starts paying taxes when he gets more than $20,000 income. So I graphed in blue the actual average tax rate. How much tax is does he pay divided by his income? So I made a plus about how tax, tax rates and marginal tax rates are different. Well, the marginal tax rate is if I earn another dollar of income, how much does the government take away? The average tax rate is how much of my money goes to the government, the sort of thing that politicians talk about. You can tell they are vastly different. If the guy earning $50,000, why is it so different marginal from average? Well. He's only paying the 40% rate on his last 
about his last $10,000. So he, in the end, pays $6,000 in taxes for an average rate of 12.5%, even though every extra dollar he earns, he pays 40% of them. And in this economy, I assume there was even numbers of people so that all income, all taxes divided by all income is only 4%. Now, let, let's look at the, at the effects of progressivity here. <clears throat> the effect has been we get the disincentive effects of a 40% tax rate. Mr. Moneybucks here, if he earns an extra dollar, only, you know, he, only, he has to pay 40% of it to the government. So he has all those incentive effects that say go fishing. But we're only collecting 4% of total income here in taxes. So making it progressive, it means some people have very high margins, other people have very low margins. You get the disincentive effects without the revenue effects. Um, we also forget the economy cares about all taxes. So in the US discussion, we're all, we're all hot and bothered about federal income taxes. What counts is this. I get an extra dollar from an employer. How much extra beer do I get? Now, after not just federal income taxes, federal, state, local, payroll taxes, sales taxes, excise taxes, property taxes, if I give it to my kids, estate taxes, every single tax that lies between uh, the extra dollar earned and the extra dollar uh, and, the, and the extra consumption. Greg Mankiw uh, uh, tried to put this together. It's very complicated because we have an extremely complicated tax code. Uh, he, he tried to do this on his blog. He came up with 93% as his marginal tax rate and explains why if you offer Greg Mankiw a consultant, there's no thank you. And transfers as well. So another place margins matter. If I, if, if when you earn an extra dollar of money, I take that, I, I take away a dollar with benefits, that's exactly the same as taxing you a dollar. Now, it doesn't go in the tax code. We're all hot and bothered about the federal tax code. We're all hot and bothered about if somebody earns an extra dollar, does he have to give it to the federal government? And we never talk about if he earns another dollar, do I take away a dollar of benefits? But of course, checks given from the government to you is exactly the same as checks given from you to the government. I mean, it's just money going on. Here's a, couple, a very nice graph of what happens to poor people. Actually, some of the highest marginal tax rates in the US are paid by poor people. And the reason is because we take away the benefits. And I'm sure it works the same way in New Zealand. Uh, so the, the, uh, this is a function of gross income. How much do you actually get? Well, uh, as you start at zero, now you get something. What you're getting is, is the, the value of all your government, uh, of all your government programs. So around uh, $10,000, what's this cliff? Well, it, this is a over 100% marginal tax rate. If you earn one extra dollar, they take away all your food stamps. So earning one extra dollar is a very bad idea if you earn looks like about $8,000 a year. Similarly, around $26,000 a year, if you earn one extra dollar, they kick you off health insurance. Well, to getting that new job is a horrendously bad idea. You can see, roughly speaking, for poor people in the US, Working does not pay until you start getting into the $50,000 a year bracket. Uh, and it, it, it's very strong incentive. Well, you know, now you know one of the reasons that, that we're having a problem of, of people getting stuck in the poverty. Here's another graph. I really went nuts on the graphs, but I think they're more memorable. To make the point, so the uh, the, I stole this graph, I didn't make it, which is why there's too much text on it. Um, but the important lines here, the red line is the, is the top marginal tax rate. So in the big discussion about the US, maybe we should go back to the 1950s when the world was so great, it was improvement, uh, and, and, large, and the, the highest tax bracket was in 70%, lower than the uh, The black line is government revenue as a fraction of income. The astounding fact about the US tax system is we can say we're charging the rich 70% or we can say we're charging the rich 28%. It doesn't make a bloody bit of difference. The, the government, at all, uh, federal government takes 35% of GDP no matter what the tax rates are. Why? Well, because when they say 70%, all the rich people go up to their tax lawyers and the tax lawyers talk to their lobbyists. And next thing you know, we get deductions for this and deductions for that and then some great scheme going on. Nobody actually pays the 70% rate. When it goes down, then, uh, then you don't get the, those effects. So uh, the, the idea that we're going to make lots, lots and lots of money by raising taxes on the rich, uh, it's just, I'm not arguing against it. On, I'm just showing you it doesn't work in the US tax system for exactly the same reasons. Oh, 
that's, that's my next graph. <clears throat> um, so uh, the, the last reason why I why this raise taxes idea doesn't work, and I think many um, economists who say it does are, are, are making a mistake, this thinking of this graph, this beautiful laugh graph, is entirely static. So when people look at this, then they argue, and it's quite sensibly look. The, the average, certainly men in the labor force are going to work 40 hours a week. So if we tax them more, what they're going to, you know, they're, they're going to work 37 hours a week. I'm sorry, they got to work 40 hours a week. That's the way jobs work in the U.S. And argue about women in the labor force in the U.S., they tend to be more sensitive to wages. I think that's missing the point entirely. If you raise uh, tax rates, it takes time. It's if, if we, if we, the U.S. raised taxes, I think this is my forecast, I think we will raise taxes, and here's what that's going to happen. First year, we're going to make a fair amount of money on it. And then slowly but surely, people find the deductions, they find the exclusions, they learn how to game the life insurance system, they learn how to game the estate tax system, they set up defective pumping trusts, and all the interesting things people do when tax rates go up, and the revenue slowly declines uh, over time. And that's the real danger here. Thinking about labor supply and people working and people taking jobs is, is entirely the wrong question. The question is, if we raise tax rates, not do people work less, if we raise tax rates, do people um, stop going to school? Or go, instead of going to school for a hard degree like accounting that pays more in the end, do they say, well, you know, it pays the same, I might as well go take art history, that's more fun. Do people not start businesses? Do people move their businesses offshore? All of these things take a lot of time to build in. It's, it's sort of like if you said, you know, the heck with it. I'm going to just start eating hamburgers and fried food all the time. Well, it takes a while to clog up your arteries. And it takes a similar while for, for marginal tax rates to clog up an economy. That's not considered the usual argument. But of course, our danger, where did our danger go? There's a, where the, there's a good danger graph. Our danger is that we're heading into a period of slow growth. And I think the worry is that, that, the, that uh, a high distorting tax system will in fact, uh, will, will give us more of that slow growth. If that's true, then we are, we're already past the top of the ladder. The, 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 you can make some simple calculations, which I won't do in the evening. It takes very, very small effects of taxes on growth to just wipe out any long-term benefit. So that's the big discussion uh, in the US. Uh, how much does uh, sharply higher marginal tax rates lower growth? Uh, one side says, well, you know, things were great during Clinton and Eisenhower. The other side says, well, that was despite high tax rates, not because of the high tax rates. Uh, nobody paid the taxes. They paid their tax lawyers. I, I think in the, in the US, we're very insular. We don't look across the Atlantic where this experiment is being run out, run out for us. Europe has tried. The first thing they did is, is they tried higher taxes, especially on, on the rich, especially on wealth, uh, especially on the returns to investment. Europe kind of said loudly, anybody who might think about hiring somebody, we're going to tax you a lot. What happened was very quickly they, they got themselves into a second, uh, second um, recession. Uh, Europe is growing very slowly or doing, you know, Greece is in free fall. Uh, I like to call it austerity spirals. You, you raise the tax rates, income goes down, then your deficits get worse, you raise the tax rates some more. Uh, the UK gave us a beautiful experiment. They raised uh, the highest tax bracket from 40 to 50%. Their forecasts were that they were gonna get, I think, uh, uh, 13 billion pounds out of this. They got two. Uh, why? Because about half the rich people just disappeared. Millionaires on the tax code, on the tax rolls one year just weren't there the next year. Uh, either they moved away or they just stopped becoming millionaires. Now, I don't, I don't want to say that tax policy is not part of it. The U.S. has a, an unbelievably chaotic uh, tax system, uh, and, and now it's even worse. Not only is it, is it thousands of pages long, but apparently we rewrite it every year in January in the middle of the night with all the lobbyists and, and tax lawyers around to make sure that their special deal is in it too. Uh, so there's plenty that can be done. What we need is, is a serious tax reform. And uh, now here is where you get your economist badge. You can understand that we can lower tax rates and take in more money. 
So our system is one in which we have supposedly high tax rates, but then just this huge amount of deductions and exclusions and credits and subsidies and so forth. So the Silicon Valley billionaires buy $100,000 Tesla Roadsters, and the government sends them a check for $7,000 uh, because they're being so green as they drive their way down into private jets. Well, this is the kind of stuff that infects our tax code. <laughs> Uh, if you get rid of the deductions, exclusions, and so forth, you can, ha you can raise more money while keeping that marginal rate. The big thing that matters to an economist, the marginal rate, if I earn an extra dollar, how much extra do I keep? Well, if I take away your deductions, I get more money out of you, but I don't change that margin. Well, we need a simple, uh, simple tax code that, that lowers the marginal rates so you get less disincentive effect while at the same time raising more revenue. In the end, I, I, I hate to say this with a camera running, a consumption tax is, is the right answer. The, a consumption tax raises revenue with the least distortion. Many people in the, sort of on the right in the US don't want to do it because of what they're worried about is we're just going to get them raising revenue. And that's going to finance a huge size of, uh, increase in the size of government. That's a good answer, but, but in the end, we need a sane tax system. So um, let me move on to if things, uh, where was I here? Uh, find my slides. Uh, if things do go wrong, what will it look like? I've outlined two options here. The, the options of let it grow, it will work. The option of trying to raise taxes, which I, I, I worry about, that I think what's going to happen if we just raise taxes within our chaotic tax system, especially, what we will get is, is slower growth. We won't get the revenue that we want, and, and things will go bad. And of course, we don't, if we don't do anything, we're, we're headed uh, towards a cliff. So what does it look like? Um, well, obviously, if you don't pay it off, <laughs> uh, I, if you don't pay it off, then, then you're going to end up defaulting on it and inflating it away. But let's think about what that process looks like. Uh, here, the central fact, the central, you know, what can I tell you that's new about this? The central fact I can tell you is how, how very much it matters that uh, our government debt is largely short-term debt. And that's what makes everything much worse. That's what makes um, that's what makes crises happen. Every crisis is, in some sense, uh, it, every crisis comes down to short-term debt. In the U.S., uh, surprisingly, our, our debt is very short. Now the numbers are a little bit hard. Hard. The standard numbers don't really work. I think a good number to keep in mind is how much of the debt do we roll over uh, every year? When we roll over half our debt every year. Rollover. Here's what that means. Every two years, uh, the U.S. has 16 trillion in outstanding debt, and one trillion every year in, de in deficits. <clears throat> what that means is every two years, the government has to borrow not only two trillion dollars for that that deficit, it has to borrow um, something like eight trillion dollars to pay off the debt that just matured. So we need a, a total of I think I'm up to 10 trillion dollars of new borrowing every. Years. So what if bond markets don't want to do that? Well, that's that's the trouble. What happened to Greece? Greece did not come to a point where it, it couldn't uh, finance its current deficits. Greece's problem was it had to sell new bonds to pay off the old bonds, and it couldn't get anybody to buy the new bonds that were going to be used to pay off the old bonds. Now, why is this such? Why is short-term debt such uh, such trouble? Here's a slide, uh, and I, let me tell a story of building a factory, because I think that will be easier to follow, and then, then we'll talk about the governments. So um, you're going to build a factory. It's going to cost you $10 million. So let's look at the top slide. Suppose, and, and it's, it's a 10-year project. So you build a factory, and then 10 years from now, it's either the product's going to work. I, I want to make it work. So build this project. 10 years from now, it either works or it doesn't work. So you, you borrow ten million dollars. If ten years from now the thing works out, you pay off your uh, you pay off your bondholders, and everything's fine. You keep the profit. Ten years from now, if it doesn't work, well, you stiff your bondholders in the bank. Now let's think about what happens if around year five there's a rumor. It's a, let's make it a research and development project, right? So you got to create the create a new drug, clinical trials. Is it going to work? It's going to take ten years. Either we're going to make one. Halfway down the pipe, year five, a rumor comes that maybe things aren't going so well at your lab. 
Uh, what happens now? So the bond market say, oh, this is a terrible project. We think it's only worth $5 million. Well, you borrow 10-year money. The price of your bonds falls in half. Your bondholders call up, and they're really mad. Uh, but uh, the bond price falls. That's the end of that. You haven't promised to pay them anything until year 10. So uh, you have some unpleasant calls in bondholders, but that's about it. Now, let's suppose you, you chose uh, short-term financing. So in year zero, you borrow $10 million, but you only borrowed it for a year. And at the end of the first year, you've got to borrow with another $10 million plus interest to pay off the first $10 million. And in the second year, you've got to borrow another $10 million to pay off those guys. So that's how short-term financing works. That's what I've tried to do the little arrow for rolling over the debt. Now, what happens if halfway down this price, this, this is going to work the same way, right? But halfway down this pike, uh, the same thing happens. There's, there's news or rumor. The bond market investors say, you know what, this project isn't work. Well, all of a sudden now, on that rumor, you're not going to find anybody to lend you $10 million to pay off old bondholders. They just say, why should I be the sucker? Because this thing isn't worth $10 million tomorrow. I might give you five for it, but you don't need five. You need ten. If you can't come up with $10 million to pay off the old bondholders, you're bankrupt. So you can see what happens with short-term debt. Short-term debt means that new bad news about the future gives you a crisis to Short-term debt means that bad news about the future makes you bankrupt today, not just bond prices go down. If you had, if you had borrowed long-term, uh, after the bad news came, you'd have five more years to fix the problems, to make things happen. You'd have, you'd have some breathing space. Nope. With short-term debt, the minute there's bad news, uh, there's a run into crisis, and, and you're, uh, you're literally bankrupt today. Now, this is how governments work, too. Governments are, the, what is the asset? What is the cash flow? You're borrowing against future taxes. You're borrowing against stuff that's going to be paid off 20, 30, 40 years in the future. We have a very long-term liability. Yet, what do our governments do? They borrow very short-term. They roll over short-term debt constantly. Uh, this is, by the way, this is uh, no big secret. The financial crisis, Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, their smart idea was that they were going to finance a portfolio of mortgage-backed securities the way they were going to do it is they rolled over their debt every night. And if you're not in finance, you go, what the heck? How does this work? This is, in fact, how the world at least used to work. They were leveraged 30 to 1, and every single day they had to come up with new borrowers to pay off the old borrowers from last night. And, and, and that fell apart. Well, our governments, but we don't seem to be learning from experience. Our governments are doing the exact same thing that the, that the investment banks did uh, back in the battle days. So, um, so this is a situation of our government. Now you can understand, sir, sir what, what, what happened to Greece was bondholders lost faith in the year 10, year 20 thing. They refused to roll over the debts. Now, suppose you are a, a uh, government official, especially a European government official. What does this feel like? Uh, what, there's some, some rumor in the papers and the bond market, the, the uh, new investors say, I'm not giving you $10 million just to pay off the old investors. But there's nothing you know, fundamentally wrong with the company. The company's still going to be okay. It's just news, of, it's just opinion about what's going to happen five years from now. Well, if, if you're a government official, this feels like speculation, contagion, illiquidity, temporary market impairments. Uh, and, and that's, you know, the Europeans, when this hit Greece, what do they do? They, they put in short sales uh, bans. And, and speculation bans, because they, they didn't want us to hear, oh, well, you know, there's something to that. <laughs> uh, illiquidity and ins insolvency are very hard, in fact, to tell apart. Um, well, that's, that's the feeling of what a, what a uh, financial crisis looks like. Richard's description is, as, uh, as this starts to happen, um, you know, but as bond markets lose faith, your long-term interest rates go up, and that's, in fact, why governments start borrowing shorter and shorter. Nobody's going to borrow, lend you money to pay back in year 10. At best, they're going to lend you money in the hope that somebody else will pay them back. And you can see that there's this Keynesian beauty contest. You're just you're investing because of the next investor. When do you put money into the bottom uh, row? You, you put money into that not necessarily because you think it's a good project. You put money in if and only if you think somebody next year will buy the new bonds that are there to pay you off. 
So you might be willing to lend to governments because you think, well, I know this is a terrible idea, but there's a greater sucker out there. That's why a lot of people bought market back securities. They, they thought, well, yeah, it's terrible, but it's going to go up before it goes down. But of course, that's a very, very unstable system. You can see why it's prone to crises. So my, the, the news I have for you is, is that uh, government debt, by being short term, uh, how will it feel if things go bad? Because our governments are borrowing short and rolling them over, we are prone not just to 25 years from now, oh boy, how do we pay for Medicare? We're prone not just to rising long-term interest rates. That's what happened here. Lowing bond prices is rising long-term interest rates as, as people start worrying about it. What we're open to is, is this kind of uh, debt crisis. And that could happen in the US too. Now the US and the Eurozone as a whole have another option at my red zone. They don't have to go bankrupt or, or get a bailout from somebody else, which is good because there's no one to bail us out. They can print money to pay off the debt. So what could happen, what is most likely to happen if there's a crisis like that to the US is, is we get a sharp inflation as opposed to an actual default, but neither of those is very good. And, and, and that sharp inflation, now there's nothing the central bank can do about that inflation. So let's say we hit this moment in the US, people say, I'm not lending money to you guys. And, and then the government says, well, we are, we're not going to go bankrupt here. We're not going to default on the debt, so we'll just print money to pay off the debt. Well, what the central bank is supposed to do is, of course, sell debt to buy the money back, but nobody wants the debt. That's the whole problem. So this is a, you know, they, they don't count on central banks to bail you out. Now, I, of course, think there's a moral of this. <clears throat> I, I think the US government should borrow as long as humanly possible. Long-term interest rates are absurdly low right now. We are, we are not in this situation. Uh, I think the bond markets uh, have faith that we are still a serious country. And we will solve this problem and we will pay off our long-term bonds. But they could wake up and change their mind. In the meantime, 30-year U.S. government bonds are 2.77%. Now, what do you think the chances are that inflation is less than 2.7% over the next 30 years? It's just an absurdly low interest rate. I, I hope none of you have bought 30-year government bonds. Well, actually, I hope you have. And tell your friends at the Central Bank of China that they need to keep borrowing and buying lots and lots and lots of them. Because, they, you know, they bought a trillion dollars of our debt, and then we, and then we devalued it, and they keep buying more of it. The policy that China should be flowers and chocolates, and we'll, we'll never do it again. I'm sorry, honey cards. Uh, I'm, I'm straying off topic. At these low interest rates, shoot, for the U.S., they move from the bottom maturity structure to the top maturity structure, and cost very little money. And then it would offload all that risk onto the bond markets. If, if people say, oh my gosh, these guys are never going to get their acts together, then what happens is long-term interest rates go up. Yeah, we're unhappy about it, but we're not facing a crisis. We're not facing a rollover crisis like, like recently. Of course, you know, there are, our government's doing exactly the opposite. That the Fed is, is, is trying to offset the treasury and go short as possible. So with these in mind, let me just uh, let me close by, by prognosticating a little bit. Where you, you, you've seen the, uh, the options, austerity, I don't, you know, higher tax rates, I think that leads to slower growth and doesn't pay off debts of its magnitude. Growth will be good, but it, it, takes a, it takes a kind of liberalization that nobody seems to uh, have a mind to do. I didn't talk about stimulus, but that's so silly that uh, we can talk about it over here. I need to be here to talk about stimulus. And, and uh, this is the danger that we face. So where, where are we now? Uh, Europe, Europe got to this moment. So, so Greece experienced this, what happened at the bottom. Uh, the uh, Europe people in charge. Um, the, 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 um, there's a lot of, if I find a polite word, um, <clears throat> a lot of um, strange thinking coming out of Europe. Now, one strange uh, concept is the idea that a currency union cannot tolerate sovereign default, uh, which is really weird when you think about it. So people keep saying, oh, Greece has to leave the euro if they can't pay back their debts. Well, so if a company in, in New Zealand defaults on its debt, that means it has to leave the New Zealand dollar and, and, and have its own dollar. If I default on my mortgage, I can't use dollars anymore. That, that's silly. In fact, there was an instruction manual. There was an instruction manual for euro that says, hey, guys, Common currency means sovereigns default on the debt. That's, that's how it works. Um, you, you can't run up a bill and expect this to bail you out. Well, they forgot about that one. So what happened is 
and Greece faced its rollover moment. Those in charge diagnosed it as temporary, as, as, as rumor, as not a fact, but a temporary liquidity. And, and what they're going to do is, is bail them out and buy them some time. And then with that time, they would put in place the kind of liberalizing reforms and start growing again. Well, it, it hasn't happened. Uh, they're not in, in much of a move for the liberalizing reforms. They are in a move for higher taxes, which is, is really So, you know, here's, here's your choices for Europe. Uh, either Europe will get around to liberalizing, it'll start growing at 4%, and then it'll be able to pay back its debts. If it won't, eventually large parts of the Greek, Italian, Spanish debt are going to have to be basically defaulted on. Now, here's, here's what happened. Part of their bailout plan was uh, the German taxpayer bought a lot of these bonds, and so now they're on the hook for it. The bigger part now is the European Central Bank has bought uh, lots and lots of bonds. So, the European Central Bank, it's, it's a fairly simple procedure. They print euros and they use those to buy bonds. Then what they do, that's not just the direct part, so the European banks are in trouble. Now, now you might think that after the financial crisis, bank regulators would say, oh, banks can't hold anything that's dangerous like, say, Greek bonds. Instead, the European bank regulators say, oh, Greek bonds, those are sovereign debt, those are perfectly safe, so you can have as much as you want. Positive in these banks aren't, aren't, that, aren't that silly, so they're taking all their money out. So where we are now is the European Central Bank is lending money to all the, to the national banks to keep them afloat. The national banks turn around with that money and buy the sovereign debt. So in, indirectly, the European Central Bank is now sitting on the sovereign debt through its lending to all those banks. Basically printed up money to pay off this debt. What happens next? Well, if the debt doesn't default, if Europe grows and pays back its debt, it's okay. They did a great job of lender of last resort. If the debt doesn't pay off, we now have trillions of euros outstanding, and, and that leads to Europe-wide inflation. And, and past that disaster, I cannot see. The US, um, we, we have a, a, I like to call it a European welfare state with American characteristics, of singular <laughs> inefficiency. Uh, and an increasingly deregist regulatory state. But we're pretending that we can have European entitlements where the middle class doesn't pay any taxes. There's no VAT in the US. In, in Europe, middle class people get benefits and middle class people pay 20% sales taxes on, on everything they buy. So my guess of where we're going in, in, the, in the US, the, forget the fiscal cliff, this is a little molehill. We have a big uh, national discussion to decide. Are we gonna have a European welfare state very high taxes on the middle class, including some sort of VAT, and perpetual low growth and, and high debt, and so we'll look like hopefully Northern Europe and not Southern Europe, or, or, or are we going to go in the direction of, of uh, more growth, uh, a, a smaller state, uh, still like a, a compassionate state, but a, a, a much more efficient state, particularly deregulating our industries so that they can grow again. I don't think that's going to happen, but I think it's going to be a 10-year fight, and we're going to have annual cliffs and crises until that happens, so long as bond markets don't call the bluff. Um, uh, so this, this, is, this is a danger, not a forecast. Um, what, what I offer is a fairly gloomy view of the world, but it is not. We have to go this way. It's a, we're sitting on an earthquake fault, and, uh, and, and it's a good idea to make sure that the buildings are, are well built. Uh, so this is grim. Doesn't have to be grim. Growth would solve everything. Growth's in our grasp. We have the idea, new ideas. We have we have plenty of new ideas. We have plenty of entrepreneurs. We have plenty of businesses ready to go if we'll only let them do it. It's not hard. The problems are, are of our own making, um, but they're serious. Will will we, as a society, embrace simple things that everyone says has said for a generation need to be done to restore growth, or are we going to be too busy carving up the golden goose? Uh, to, to let it continue. There's lots of entrenched, in, entrenched interests, and there's also a, a public that is not convinced that a little goose golden, a little golden goose pate at the expense of the rich would taste pretty good right now. Uh, well, so sovereign debt is a great invention, but let me remind, it's kind of funny, sovereign debt was always risky. Uh, Edward IV stiffed, uh, stiffed the Medici Bank in the 1300s. Uh, Louis XVI, Czars in Argentina, we always thought of sovereign destiny being a risky thing. We lived in a 40-year peaceful moment where, where we started to think of it as the ultimate safe death uh, thing, but no longer. I think we have to go back to the larger historical view. Let us just hope that uh, 
the French Revolution was a, a default on sovereign debt. Let us hope that our work out of sovereign debt doesn't look like that. Okay, thank you. That's what I have to say. Uh, but we have time for some questions. If anyone has anything they want to say or ask. Joe, I encourage yes, please. I agree wholeheartedly with you that the way
you could maybe argue that was due to an influx of technology, uh, home computers, computer businesses, people were working longer shifts at factories and things like this. But does, is it is there a way around that? Because technology is going to it's going to keep going, but it's going to flatten out. It's going to get this little longer and then just kind of maximum. <clears throat> so what happens once technology kind of starts to top out, and how do you get past that product in terms of productivity? Uh, well, that would be a huge disaster. <laughs> uh, in the end, you know, why are we so much wealthier than our grandparents? Because it's not about, you know, it's not about the unemployment, right? In the end, you know, the number of jobs is the number of people. Uh, it's because each of us uh, is so much, incredibly much more productive. You know, we can each make, you know, a farmer using a tractor is a lot more than a farmer using a plant. So information technology is part of it. Don't, don't just think about technology. I mean, that, you know, the organization of businesses has gotten a lot better. Just in time manufacturing is something that meant we can you know, make stuff with fewer workers. Um, so it's, it's not just... Now, if, if productivity stops growing, if, if new ideas, new technologies stop coming in, and, uh, that, that, that's an unholy disaster. That, that means that uh, the growth... So since 1750, we, we started growing. Uh, before about 1750, there was no growth. You, you, would, you would live the same standard of living, doing the same things as your grandfather, great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather, great-great-great. In fact, for long periods of time, there's actually been getting worse. From the plague until, from the 1350s until 1750, things got worse per capita because you have the same technology, but they have more people and, and less land per person, so things are super bad. So it is only the increase in technology that, that makes us keep growing. So these trend lines, there's a tendency in economics to put trend lines up there. Was a good long trend line? As long as I got. There's a tendency to put them in there and think they're sort of constants of nature, God-given things that will come to us. No, every bit of that trend line comes out of hard work of people starting new businesses, figuring out better ways and more efficient ways of doing things, applying more technology, coming up with new things. <laughs> And if that ends, then, then growth stops, and among other things, we default on all our debts. But we all, you know, significantly uh, poor, there's you know, the end of Western civilization. Western. <laughs> it's true. Uh, yes? What was the health situation in the way? What happens if technology gets too good, and say that I invent an amazing piece of software that can single-handedly wipe out the entire profession of the stats, and so all of those people are now out of work, no one's paying them to do what they were paying them to do previously because my software doesn't extend. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I imagine it's a good thing because they all learn to write that software, so it's winners and losers. So, um, you know, the buggy whip manufacturers didn't like it when cars were invented. This uh, famous controversy in the U.S. over whether automatic teller machines were a good thing or a bad thing is a bunch of bank tellers lost their jobs. But uh, eventually they found jobs doing something else. Um, so yeah, in the end, the number of jobs is the number of people working. And if those people can have tools that allow them to produce better things, then that's wonderful. Yeah? You said the number of jobs is the number of people. But that's not really so. I mean, you wouldn't have welfare if everybody had a job, you wouldn't have that just to spread. It seems that there is a mismatch between number of jobs and number of people, and that is part of the whole world. Yeah, so, so there's certainly, so there's recessions in the short run when people find it hard to find jobs. So, you know, like, like I have a graph even that made that point. There's, a lot, there's about 10 million people who lost their jobs and are permanently, seem to be permanently out of work, and that's a disaster. But, but uh, China has, has like 800 billion jobs, and, and the U.S. has like 150, I mean 800 million jobs, the U.S. has like 150 million jobs, and that's not because China has, you know, better welfare policies or something, right. they just have more people. <laughs> so in, in the end, um, you know, population doubles, roughly speaking, the number of jobs is, is going to double no matter, no matter what you do. So it, it was a long-term problem on, on that. Uh, it's a big problem, like with the schools, and lots of people in the U.S. Lots of people in the U.S. get stuck in uh, this trap. Where did my trap go? Uh, they get stuck in this trap. Yes, they are this trap. You know, they get stuck over on the left here, where they're either not working or working illegally, and they think, about, well, if I get a job and I report the income, then I lose my health insurance. And so there's definitely problems with fractions of the population getting stuck out of the 
but as the population doubles, the number of jobs is up doubling. And, and eventually, what makes us richer, we, we can't, what makes eventually what makes us, you know, double our income in society is that each of us who is working produces twice as much stuff. Sorry? It just means there's been a thing that I'm working on being living or living in the sun, then I'm not actually very motivated to work. So I, I think there's, yeah. there's a lot of issues about what wages are being paid relatively like that whole sort of discussion that's sort of not going to be done quality. He doesn't feel so good to be working on my wages because you can't purchase much, so you're not really a consumer, so everyone else, everything. That would seem to be more of an issue. I mean, it's an issue too, but you know, so let's think about 1910 to now. You know, what, what makes now so much better than 1910? Well, it's not about those issues. It's about these tractors, not about plows. And, and what's going to make the difference if we're going to have, like, <coughs> what's going to make the difference of our being able to pay off this kind of debt as we go from now to 2030 to 2050, it, it's not about redistribution and welfare programs. It, it's about can we get new innovative businesses in the area with the Corresponding environmental cost to the economic growth. Oh, yeah. So, from 2050, we'll be using a lot of cheap energy. Uh, is that coming from any? Not necessarily. I mean, uh, we, we're actually we're becoming more of a service economy uh, than, a, uh, than a building things economy. So, uh, certainly, energy is, is a puzzle that we're so worried about it because, in, in economics terms, it's one of the goods, certainly over the long run with the flattest supply curve and the easiest substitutes. So, uh, you know, I, I really, sure, if you worry about carbon, why don't we just build nuclear plants? Yeah, you should zero carbon and you know, we burn a nuclear plant hydrogen economy. Eventually, that would be just as cheap. You can know, do other stuff if you want to. Uh, but yeah, um, uh, uh, you, don't you don't have to have a dirty economy to have a growing economy. And most of the stuff we seem to be doing these days, I mean, right now, we're, we're Big new ideas are, are, of course, electronics, software. If we have this thing, you know, Gutenberg invented movable pipe and, and an explosion followed. But we just did that again, 10 times over with the internet. You can talk to anyone you want. We're just beginning to think about what to do with that. Biotech uh, seems like, you know, we're finally figuring out how the human beings work. You know, we kind of really all this stuff, the, the, uh, the health care market about delivering that, but it's certainly as far as technology. Those kinds of things are not particularly environmentally. The right. environmental footprint seems to increase to be similar to a growth. Uh, yeah, yeah, but it doesn't have to. The price things? No, it's price. That's environmental. Yeah. Um, so you talk about how uh, growth is achieved through productivity. And I would think productivity is defined as um, what you get per hour of labor, not in terms of if you work more, but you, you, get, you get more outputs, uh, that's just, you work more. Yeah. Um, so, to achieve better technology, yeah, and that's exactly right, because there's a limit to how much more you can work. Yes. You can't work more than 24 hours a day. <coughs> yeah. And, we, we, you know, New Zealand can't have 400 million people, you know, in, in, the, in the sweatshops or whatever it's going to get out. So, you need to, individuals who are working need to do better. Yeah. Yes. So, um, you need to get the technology to achieve better um, output per hour. Now, there's a couple of ways the government can intervene to achieve this. They could incentivize everyone to, um, to go or go into research and innovation by, for example, subsidizing um, the salaries of scientists or, or whatever. But um, that comes with inefficiency because then nobody will grow food because growing food doesn't get you the subsidies. So in your opinion, is a free market approach to achieving better technology, so leave the private sector um, to conduct its own research without intervention from the government, better than um, having the states intervene, and thus 
bolstering the research outputs artificially? Well, right now, so fundamental research is really bottleneck. I mean, yeah, fundamental research is really bottleneck. But, you know, we all know this. Look around any university. <laughs> you know, we are not paragons of efficiency. We look a whole lot more like, like the post office than we do like the Federal Express. But that's what you say. You're not going to do it. But that's not really the, the bottleneck is getting new ideas implemented into new businesses. And the problem is that new businesses, when they come in, they put old businesses out, out of business and they don't like it. And they call the government up and say, well, you need protection from these upstarts. So really, think it's, it's you know, Apple gave us great stuff. Now, they didn't do, they didn't invent the transistor. <laughs> they, they put it all together. So the bottlenecks is, is the implementation of it. And, and, and,